Well, for decades, the Bay Area has let itself become a haven for vagrants at the expense of the few normal people who still live there. Finally, somebody had enough. Earlier this month, a man was videotaped gathering up a vagrant's belongings and throwing them in the trash. It was on public property, by the way. Now, that man has been charged with second-degree robbery, and, of course, the area remains a scene. And, of course, the area remains the same hive of needles and human waste it has been for years. Rebecca Kaplan is an Oakland City Council member, and she joins us tonight. Rebecca, thank you for coming on. So this story evening, had me thinking, me. if I... Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. If I showed up on your front lawn with a sleeping bag and a case of vodka and sort of moved in to stay, which I may do, would you be arrested for trying to make me leave? Well, I would uh, welcome you. I'd be happy to have that conversation with you and hope we could have dinner sometime. <laughs> but I think more to the point, <laughs> no. uh, the person who threw the belongings, in this case of a homeless man, into the lake uh, and stole somebody else's cell phone, uh, that person would be prosecuted whether the person they did that to was homeless or not. However, as to the deeper solutions, tomorrow the city of Oakland will be debating our budget and I will be fighting for better solutions to homelessness. We need to be helping people live in situations other than our streets and sidewalks, even while I absolutely right. condemn this assault and would condemn it no matter who it was done to. So, but what is, what, I mean, it just seems like the cards are kind of stacked against normal people, married people with kids who have jobs, kind of like the backbone of America, the people who actually built the country. They're having a tougher time living in your state, so they're leaving, as you know. People get arrested for taking homeless, detritus trash off public property, but they don't get arrested for defecating in public? How does that work? What's the thinking behind that? Well, certainly, if people want to volunteer to help clean up our lake, our creeks, our public ways, we have volunteer opportunities. We have ways that people can help clean up, and I welcome that. This was not an act of cleaning up the lake. This was stealing someone's belongings well, well, and throwing them into the, the lake. Clean that up? was a trashing uh, of but, but it. But wait, wait a second. We, we have a ready-made group of people, a lot of them young, with tons of time on their hands. We call them the homeless. Why don't they clean up? their crap. Why are they the ones littering? Why aren't they cleaning up? Actually, it's predominantly not the homeless people that are littering. We did a study, and about 85% of the illegal dumping is coming from a variety of illegal sources having nothing to do uh, with the homeless. And so the illegal dumping oh, that is a huge problem from. that we're fighting to and crack down is on is the word. Is is no. very serious. Well, good. I'm glad you're doing and that. So that's, so you're that's getting absolutely to the one of the things okay. we need to take action on. As well as, but of still, course, why wouldn't, providing you know, better places for the homeless to be. In other words, it's not enough to say where we don't want people to go. We need to provide the places, and I'm fighting for us to use public land, churches that have offered to volunteer their sites, to allow the homeless to have places they can be where they can get assistance, where they can get matched right. with social services, and turn their lives around while living in places better than the sidewalks. But, have you, but in the meantime, and churches assaulting certainly people have a lot of and robbing in them is unacceptable. Well, that's not, I mean, well, cleaning you know, up public Tucker, spaces last time would be the way I, came I would on, describe it. I tried but, to but, talk but, to you about you scripture, one... and you didn't want to, but I'd be happy to remind us all uh, <laughs> that just we are judged by how we treat the least from of these. A lefty. Right. I, well, I agree with that, but let's ask the deeper questions, because I know that you want to. Why is it California's so-called homeless problem is often blamed on housing costs, and as in most liberal cities, they're really high, because it's all rich people who live there. But Tokyo has even higher housing prices and it has no homeless problem. What does Tokyo know that Oakland and San Francisco don't know? Most other democracies in the world devote a significantly larger share of their public funds to helping the homeless, to providing social services, to providing oh, job training programs. No, nope, nope, not true, there's not true. They don't have a ton of broken families and drug problems in Japan. Do you think maybe there's a connection between the, the total disintegration of the American family and the fact that a lot of people are living outside on heroin? We actually have a very sad situation of families living outside. We have people living on the streets it's mostly not who families, get up though, and go to know. work every day and come back and sleep yes, in a Yes, I know. That's true. After working all day because that is the true. housing is so scarce and so expensive. And that's why in our budget debate but, taking place tomorrow night, I'll be fighting for us to do more to protect affordable housing and to do more. Okay, but, but really quick, have you thought the about the Tokyo to thing? Homeless. I mean, because they... 
they don't spend more money than you do on the homeless. They spend much less. Their housing prices are higher. I mean, maybe there's a solution there. I don't know if we're going to solve it on the show because we're almost out of time. But have you thought about that? Will you think about it? Well, most of the countries with less of this problem have universal health care, so people don't get pushed into financial <laughs> dire straits from a health care okay. cost. But I also know right. that we don't we'll get better. I'm sorry, we're out of time. We Rebecca, thank you. I hope you'll come back anytime. It's great to see you. The New York Times just came after the show for daring to question that newspaper's accuracy. Hmm, we'll slowly unpack that next. On Friday's show, we made the point that much of the news Americans are told is factual turns out to be propaganda. That seemed like an obvious point. Human beings lie. That is their nature. Powerful people tend to lie quite a bit in order to protect their prerogatives. Journalists who have the power to shape perception are especially vulnerable to dishonesty. You ought to watch them carefully. You ought to watch them carefully. Well, there's nothing especially controversial about that observation. It's obviously true. And yet, maybe not surprisingly, a lot of reporters found it deeply offensive. Michael Barbero of the New York Times called it, quote, repugnant. As he put it, it's, quote, literally damaging to our democracy that anyone would doubt the accuracy of his newspaper. Question the New York Times, and America falls apart. Pretty funny. In other news, the Carrier Corporation has announced that it's immoral not to use air conditioning. Buy our product or you're going to hell. In fact, as is so often the case, the opposite is true. Skepticism is not unpatriotic. It is your duty. Principled questions don't destroy democracy. They sustain it. The people in charge don't like to be second-guessed. And why would they? A skeptical population makes their lives more complicated. They'd like you to swallow your medicine without complaint. Shut up and obey. Don't ask questions. Accept what you're told and get back to work. Well, that's a lot to ask, especially coming from the New York Times. There's a lot of interesting detail in that newspaper day to day and good for them for printing it. But there's also an awful lot of lying, especially about the big things. Remember the New York Times spent an entire year assuring us that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction? We went to war over that. Many thousands died and it was a lie. Or how about when the Times told us that Barack Obama's toppling of Muammar Gaddafi would turn Libya into quote, a productive partner with the West. It will be interesting to know what the families now being sold in Libya's open slave markets think of that prediction. And who can forget this Times headline from the spring of 1975 when the Khmer Rouge took over Cambodia? Quote, for most, a better life. Well, a third of the population went on to die in genocide in Cambodia. The Times has yet to issue a correction. Nowadays, the Times is hyping the Russia hoax, telling us that Moscow is the greatest threat to this country when it's clearly not. The paper is trying to provoke yet another pointless war in Syria by pushing the claim that Bashar al-Assad gassed his own people. Times reporters pretend to know for certain that that happened, that Assad did it. They don't know that for certain. Once again, they're lying. We could go on. We're not making a partisan point here, by the way. The New York Times is hardly the only powerful institution that distorts the truth. Someday soon, for example, maybe this week, the Republican leadership in the House may announce an amnesty for more than a million people in this country illegally. They'll tell you that letting foreigners ignore our laws is good for America. Don't believe them. They're lying. Our country has changed a lot, and the divide is no longer between Republicans and Democrats, or even between left and right. It's really between the incompetence in charge and everyone else. A small group of people has become rich and powerful mismanaging this country. And in fact, I've written a book about them. It's called Ship of Fools. It's out in the beginning of October. You can order it now if you want. But in the meantime, remember that you don't reflexively owe anybody your allegiance outside your immediate family, and that includes the news media. You don't have to hate the people in charge, but be sure to stay skeptical. They lie a lot. Well, career day in elementary school is a great chance to get kids dreaming about their futures when they can grow up and become teachers, doctors, and apparently cop haters. One elementary school in Chicago enraged parents, understandably, after its principal invited an activist to the school who routinely posts violent anti-cop rhetoric online. Fox's Matt Finn was contacted about this, reported it, and has all the details. Matt?
Tucker, that Chicago Elementary School principal Mary Beth Kunat suddenly retired with just weeks left in the school year. It happened after she invited a police extremist to talk to students at Wildwood Elementary School here in Chicago. That extremist on social media calls himself a radical. In February, when a Chicago police commander was shot and killed execution style, Ethos posted online, F him and his family. Ethos also posts the term CPDK, which stands for Chicago Police Department Killers. The anti-police extremist refers to cops as pigs and posted about killing all the rich people. Ethos has hatred for police because he alleges that a Chicago police officer killed his friend with a taser. The school principal says she brought in this anti-police extremist to talk to students about his poetry and civic work, but things went off the rails. We talked to one mother whose three children listened to Ethos on career day. He told them that all the police were bad and all the police wanted to kill people. I was very disappointed that someone would come into the school and preach hate uh, about the police. Or even if he was talking about anyone else, it would have upset me. Mary Beth Kunat wrote a letter of apology before resigning, writing in part, I was present when his narrative took a negative turn about policing, at which point I immediately intervened. I care about your children and would never intentionally expose them to or endorse this type of negativity. Some parents dispute that Kunat immediately intervened, saying Ethos spoke to a few classes without interruption, and that Kunat, the principal, has recently been pressured by some parents to introduce anti-police philosophies to students. Nearly every parent we talked to said the principal was doing an excellent job, but ended up making this grave mistake. We talked to one Chicago police officer whose children went to the school. He says the career day speech was an indoctrination, and now the students have been exposed to Ethos online accounts. Insulted, angry. I can't believe that she didn't vet him properly. Look on his Facebook account, because some of the things that are in his Facebook account are absolutely horrible. Ethos declined our request for an interview. The Chicago School District says it was not aware of Ethos and did not approve him speaking to students. I briefly spoke to Mary Beth Kunat on the phone, and she emphasizes that she suddenly retired and did not resign with many years left in her contract. Tucker.